So one of the other things that comes up during World War One, and and when we look at kind of what Wilson has to say, you'll see that he ta- he references this concern about spies, right? Um, that Germany has spies in the U.S. and and to be fair, there were some spies, um, you know, um, but there were British spies and there was British propaganda and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so there's a lot of anxiety about kind of controlling the flow of information. Um, so you have this Committee on Public Information. This is the committee that's responsible for the propaganda posters. They're also responsible for what they call their their four minute men or no, yeah, four minute, one minute men, something like that. Um, These are guys that would go to like the silent movies and they'll kind of give a a rousing speech, support the soldiers, right? Um, You know, think about kind of like what we would do now with a commercial, for instance. Um, So they travel around doing that. Um, in order to reinforce kind of why we're doing what we're doing, why we're fighting, um, you'll also have some loyalty leagues that kind of keep an eye on immigrants and on union activity, because especially by the time you get to 1918, um, there's a lot of kind of suspicion about communism, about the Bolsheviks. This idea, you know, and socialism had been, I mean, think back to 1912, we'd actually had a socialist candidate. Um, so in 1912, we have a socialist candidate, but um, now here we are in, you know, 1917, 1918, and we know that the Bolsheviks have pulled out of the war. And so there's this concern that that this kind of Bolshevism is going to take over and that it's this existential threat to the United States because it's so counter to kind of our capitalistic society. Um, And so kind of our earliest anxieties about Bolshevism and anarchy and all that kind of stuff bubble up here. Um, And so they're keeping an eye on union activity. They're keeping an eye on workers and immigrants, all that kind of stuff. People who are pacifists. I mean, remember that we've had progressives who are part of the anti-imperialism movement. Um, So they're very suspicious about this war. So the loyalty leagues kind of keep an eye on people. Um, and that kind of thing. Uh, German Americans in particular will get questioned a lot by these loyalty leagues. And for the most part, it's about harassment. Um, sometimes they could threaten your job. Sometimes they could just harass you. They could get the police to help you uh, monitor your mail, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so the Committee on Public Information is kind of Uh, a little questionable. We'll talk about the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act. Um, The Espionage Act and the Sedition Act essentially claim that the Americans, um, or not the Americans, that the, that people can't speak out against the United States. Um, So it kind of flies in the face of the First Amendment. So the First Amendment says, you know, you can have freedom of speech and you have freedom to gather. And the Espionage and Sedition Act essentially say that you cannot say or do or write anything that interferes with the morale of the troops or the morale of the country. You can't say or do or write anything that interferes with recruitment. So when Eugene V. Debs is writing things that are critical of U.S. involvement in World War I, they go after him for the Espionage Act and say, oh, you're challenging kind of the morale of the country. Um, and so this is how you get Eugene Debs arrested. Um, the International World, International World Workers World, um, the Wobblies, they'll be particularly targeted because they're highly critical as a union um, on uh, kind of U.S. operations. Um, and the Supreme Court will decide in Schenck v. U.S. in 1919 um, that these acts that in times of natural national crisis and national security, that sometimes our civil liberties can be restricted. Um, so the Supreme Court, you know, supports these kinds of actions. Now, these are short term, short lived kind of responses. Um, that are response to kind of the concerns about spying, concerns about the questions. Um, You know, we can't, we have to have unity. We're going to force that kind of unity. So we'll look at that a little more um, specifically um, and kind of talk about that a little bit more. Um, Kind of some propaganda um, posters right there and um, kind of that's what the Committee on Public Information, the Kaisers can, can your food, grow your own food. Um, American troops are largely held back until 1918. Um, basically, uh, General John Pershing, who is the one that's in charge, you occasionally need to know his name. Um, you also sometimes have to know Alvin York. Alvin York wins the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, not really a huge deal, but just I've officially said it. Alvin York, John Pershing, 
Pershing head of the expeditionary forces, Alvin York, wins the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, so American troops are held back because Pershing says, yeah, I'm not going to let the British throw our guys into the trenches. Um, so he holds them back until you have very specific ways in which he can use the American troops to kind of push in. Um, so they will be significant. Um, they will tip the stalemate, um, especially in a few key battles like the Second Battle of the Somme and the Battle of the Marne. Um, and by the time you get to 1918, right, so so Wilson comes out with his Peace Without Victory speech in January of 1917. By the time you get to 1918, there's been a lot of noise made about, um, about these 14 points, and they basically distribute these kind of flyers all over Germany. So Germany's going to be intrigued in January of 1918 that maybe seeking peace wouldn't be that big of a deal, right? Um, you open diplomacy, free seas and trade, disarmament, democratic self-rule, an association of nations to guarantee collective security. These are all the things that he's talking about, um, trying to resolve the very kind of selfish ambition that got us into World War I. Um, so Germany at first in January of 1918 is thinking, well, we might fight this out. Um, but eventually, by the time you get to the end of 1918, um, they're going to be uh, pretty frustrated. Um, the Spanish flu has begun to run through um, Germany and their, their, their diet has become severely restricted. So they're really struggling. Um, and so you're going to have um, you're going to have this kind of fight for the armistice. Um, and so the, the Germans will begin to, to seek a peace agreement, right? Um, and so you'll have that the Kaiser is overthrown. Um, you'll have the Germans agreeing to a ceasefire. Um, this will happen on November 11th, 1918. This is why we have Veterans Day, 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Um, and basically, you know, part of it too, um, you know, France and Britain weren't real crazy about the armistice because they realized that the Americans had the Germans on the run. Um, but Wilson basically threatens them and insists that they reach an agreement. Um, so you have an armistice that is signed that causes a ceasefire. Um, again, this is within the context of an influenza pandemic, um, you know, that you'd had a lot of people that were killed. It really affected young people aged 20 to 34. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I mean, you have kind of the war effort, kind of this global conflict that's going to encourage the spread. So if you're kind of a medicine person, you're going to go into medicine or something like that. Um, this is an interesting way in which kind of disease factors into kind of global events. And so this influenza pandemic is important. Um, um, starts actually in the United States. If you're a Twilight fan, this is how Edward gets dies or whatever. Um, so you go from the armistice, and then in January of 1919, uh, you have the big four, uh, U.S., Britain, France, and Italy, um, meeting in at the Palace of Versailles in Paris for the Paris Peace Conference. Um, and so Wilson basically comes in. He's going to negotiate this peace based on the 14 points. Um, however, France, Britain, and Italy are insistent that Germany suffer, that they have to pay reparations. Um, of course, Russia is not there. Um, because the Bolshevik government's not being recognized. Um, and really, you have a lot of colonial countries. Remember, the 14 points have gone out. They've seen, oh, we're going to readjust colonial territories. And that's going to ultimately lead to... Um, you know, lead to a lot of countries like French Indochina, for instance, um, being there at the Paris Peace Conference. There's going to be a lot of disappointment because those those big big three of the big four, Britain, France, and Italy, really don't uh, don't negotiate much, right? In fact, it's really just Britain and France that kind of control things. Um, they have a lot of secret agreements. Italy barely gets what they want, um, and you know what you're going to see is that you know. There, there, there's an interest in maintaining their colonies in Asia and in Africa. Um, and so Wilson will ultimately, Wilson gets really sick while he's in Paris. Um, so there's some suspicion that his illness, whether it was the flu or a stroke or whatever, um, plays a role in him negotiating away a lot of this. Um, and so you'll have essentially um, the Treaty of Versailles that throws out pretty much everything of the 14 points with the exception of the League of Nations, right? Um, and so you'll have um, that, you know, this refusal to open season trades, negotiations behind closed doors, the guilt clause, the reparation payments. Um, and this will kind of kind of affect, um, you know, affect how the Treaty of Versailles is received. Now, you do have some early mandates in the Middle East. Um, and 
you know, I don't know that that's a good thing necessarily, but there is at least some recognition that maybe they shouldn't have to try to colonize the Middle East. Unfortunately, um, those will kind of set the stage. They'll draw these random lines. It sets the stage for tension later on. Um, So Woodrow Wilson comes back with this Treaty of Versailles, and essentially the Republican Congress says, um, no, we don't want the U.S. to be tied to foreign countries. Um, We are sick and tired of global involvement in sending our troops, and we think this kind of agreement is only going to encourage um, you know, people to get involved in, or for the U.S. to get involved, that other countries could suck us in without our approval. Uh, we don't want to give up our decision. We, Congress, don't want to give up our ability to, um, you know, make war. Um, and so that's kind of the frustration. So Wilson, who is very full of himself, right, refuses to have any compromises, um, says, no, you have to accept this League of Nations. Of course, this League of Nations was always his pet idea from the get go. Um, and so he goes on the speaking tour to try to rally support for it, but has a massive stroke. Um, in fact, there's some suggestion that the last year of his presidency, it was largely operated by his wife. Um, who really kind of kept him closed off. And so it was her and a couple of people um, that basically ran the country uh, in 19, 1920. Um, and so the U.S. The U.S. will never ratify the Treaty of Versailles. We'll end up having a series of separate peace agreements and ultimately have a joint resolution in 1921 to end the war. Um, so this cartoon kind of depicts, right, this gap in the bridge, um, kind of the fact that Um, that the U.S. never joins the League of Nations, the U.S. designed the League of Nations, and it will never be that very, that, that strong. Um, So going into World War II, the League of Nations will be largely toothless. Um, One of the big impacts here at home after the war is that the U.S. becomes very much afraid of radicalism. Um, Part of this issue is that you'd had some, some bombs, uh, you had a bomb explode on Wall Street, um, I think Herbert Hoover had a bomb explode at his house. Um, You had some anarchists that were frustrated with kind of uh, the American uh, response in World War I and the whole Paris Peace Conference. Um, And so these explosions lead to this anxiety that we're trying to have like this Bolshevik revolution, right? Um, And of course, all of this is made worse because as the war is over in 1919, the government essentially says, oh, the war's over. We don't have to control things anymore. And they like, immediately take their hands off the economy. So you immediately have, you know, companies crashing wages, laying people off, um, and you have massive inflation at the same time because now goods aren't being controlled. Um, And so what's going to happen is that you're going to have a lot of labor unrest. And of course, they're going to connect labor unrest with unions, with socialism, with Bolshevism. Um, And so they start going after anybody who might be suspected of being a red, in other words, a communist, a Bolshevist. Um, And so the the Attorney General Palmer is going to lead these Palmer raids to go after unions, to arrest people, and do a lot of this without um, due process of law. Right. And so in 1920, you have this massive red scare. It subsides fairly quickly um, once people realize that we're kind of retreating into isolationism, once the Republicans kind of win uh, in 1920. Um, But it does kind of give you a clue as to how Red Scare and the concern about socialism and communism kind of hangs around in the United States, even to this day, how we have this changed perception about socialism, even after, you know, Henry George wrote about it and Eugene V. Debs talked about it and all that kind of stuff. Well, with World War One, the United States very clearly says, yeah, we don't we're not real crazy about that. Right. So you've got this anxiety there. Um, the global context of World War I, it ends, ends progressivism. Uh, the progressive attitudes that people blame for getting us into the conflicts, um, this kind of muscular foreign policy um, that develops under progressivism, people reject. People reject the social controls, the government controls, the government always telling people what to do. Um, and so they really just kind of reject all of that. Um, We also have, of course, the impact of the Panama Canal and a transformed Europe that has now created new countries. Uh, We now have the Soviet Union with Stalin in power. Um, Britain and France will have economic problems. Um, that will, and Germany as well, they'll kind of limp along throughout the 1920s, ultimately leading to the rise of kind of fascism in the 1930s, um, largely built on the anxiety and the problems that come from um, this World War, World War I economic crisis. Um, 
humiliation of Germany creates bad feelings in Germany, um, creates a lot of resentment, um, especially there's a lot of misinformation about how the war ended, um, i.e., the Jews were to blame, that kind of thing. Uh, Japan was very frustrated. They were pretty much shut out of the peace conference. They felt like their interests, they had joined the Allies. Um, they don't really fight very much because there's not a lot going on in the Pacific. Um, but they joined the Allies and they felt like they should have gotten something for that. Um, and they don't. And so this will kind of lead to Japan being sort of in it for themselves. Um, and that's going to be a big factor going into World War II as we get into the 1930s. Um, and of course, the failed League of Nations. We can even talk about, you know, like I said, the French Indochina that later becomes Vietnam. This is what radicalizes Ho Chi Minh. Um, so these things will all come into play later on. So really, um, when you talk about World War I, you're talking about the foundation for most of the conflicts of the 20th century. Um, and, you know, even, even including the Middle East, even including Asia and Vietnam, um, all goes back to World War I. Um, and so this is why it's important that we have a kind of a basic understanding of what World War I is. Um, so I'm going to kind of stop here. This kind of gives you kind of a quick, like, like you know, deluge of information. Um, we'll kind of do kind of an overview in class, um, kind of using just pictures, kind of talking about it. So hopefully you've listened to this or maybe you've listened to this and looked over the, the American Yop textbook something like that. So you can ask questions and chime in. Um, so we'll be kind of doing a review, um, but this will serve as kind of your lecture portion. Everything else will be kind of free flowing. We're going to look at some documents about women and African Americans. We're going to look at some Woodrow Wilson documents next week um, and kind of talk about things like the Espionage and Sedition Acts. Um, and then of course, we'll be doing kind of a quick overview. Um, and then shortly after that, we should be taking a quiz over progressivism, imperialism, and World War I. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. And uh, hopefully it wasn't too awfully long.